Hello and welcome back to the Rise Bible Study and Fellowship. I am Pastor Stephen. And as always, we have our Rise family live here in our studio uh, here at 8 a.m. on the East Coast. And we, we always meet at 8 a.m. And so we're thankful that you're joining with us and you're listening to this, uh, this teaching today. The question that I have for you this morning is, are you a true follower of Christ? Are you a follower of Christ? You notice I didn't say, are you a Christian, right? Because there is a difference. Uh, a follower of Christ actually walks with him as he's walking because you're following him. And there's others who know his name. They know his story, but they don't know him as Lord and Savior. And so today uh, we're going to continue in our study in our series, Who I Am. Today's title is I Am Raised from the Dead with Christ. I'm going to say it again for those who are taking notes. And we encourage everyone to take notes. I am raised from the dead with Christ. And, and this whole teaching today is going to be about God's abundant mercy and his grace. God's abundant mercy and grace. He's given us new life in Christ. You need to say that. I have, going to say it, a new life in Christ. And yes, you do. And I want to encourage you to let others know who are followers of Christ that they also have a new life in Christ. And they can give him glory for that. Our foundational scripture for today is going to be Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. And uh, for those who don't have their Bible available, I'll go ahead and bring this up for those who are in the studio. I'll go ahead and share this. And it reads, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. We we always begin reading through the with the New Living Translation. I grew up reading the King James Version, but everybody, not everyone can understand that, that language. But we're going to go ahead and keep it in the New Living Translation. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 through 7. And it reads, but God is so rich in mercy... And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Verse seven, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, as always, we're going to stop the Bible bus. We're going to get off. We're going to walk around these scriptures right here because it's not about reading. Remember here on the rise, we don't just read the scriptures. We study the scriptures. OK, so we're going to take our time. Let's go back to verse four and then we're going to look at the whole chapter. But I want to just pause for just a second right here. Look what it says in verse four. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much. So when when we read these kind of scriptures, you want to remember he's talking to you directly. He's talking to you. He's saying he's loved you so much. He's so rich in mercy toward towards you. Mercy is unmerited favor. He's so rich in mercy towards you that he loves you so much. What did he do? That even though we were dead because of our sins. Now, remember, verse five points us back to the Garden of Eden, because if you're new to the Bible, if you're new to following Christ, you might you might be wondering, what does it mean that I was dead because I'm alive? But but I want you to remember this. We inherited the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden and the wages of sin is death. Right. Because God is righteous and he's a righteous judge. So we were born, all humankind came from Adam and Eve. All of humankind came from Adam and Eve. And everyone that was born after they sinned inherited that sin nature, right? Sin nature. That sin nature is in your flesh. And that's important to make a distinction because you have a, you have a mind, you have a body, but you are a spirit, right? Your spirit is inside of this body. And with your spirit and body connected, it makes your soul, right? So we are three parts. It is the flesh that has the sin in it, verse five, that even though we were dead because of our sins, right? So that even though you're alive, your flesh, because of sin is dead. This is what he did. He gave us life when he did what? Raised Christ from the dead. That's the power of God unto salvation. A lot of people said Jesus came and he walked the earth and he gave an example for us and he was crucified and all that's important, right? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness or remissions of sin. So Jesus came to be a, a perfect sacrifice for all of mankind. But it was because he was raised from the dead that we have been delivered for sin for, from time to eternity. He gave us life 
when he brought Jesus uh, from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead to show the power of God in the earth. It was God that resurrected him. And it was God that resurrected us through him. Look what it says. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, right? God's grace is the most important thing that we can have in this life is understanding that God's grace is what saved us. It's because God loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. God wants all his children back. Now, this is something else we teach you on the rise because you got to understand this. Every human being that has ever lived on this planet were created in God's image and after his likeness. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. Let's get this right, because there's a false doctrine that's permeating this world right now, that we're all children of God. No, we're not. Because he said, whoever should walk by the spirit of God, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Whoever walks by the spirit of God, right? So those who are following God's laid out plan for salvation and redemption through Jesus Christ, Jesus said in himself, no one can come to the father, but through me. So if they're going through Krishna, uh, Buddha, uh, uh, Allah, if they're going through, if there's any other religion in this world claiming to have a different way to get to God, they're not talking about our God. They're not talking about uh, uh, Elohim. They're not talking about Jehovah, right? They're not talking about our God, Yahweh, okay? Jehovah Jireh, our provider, he's provided a way for us, those who are truly seeking to be restored back to him, a way back to him, and that's through Christ Jesus. Now look, look at what it says, verse six again, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ. Good God almighty. I, this might be a shock to some of you because you probably never heard this. We heard that Jesus was raised from the dead, but did you know you were raised with him? Verse six says it, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ. And then what did he do for us, for you? And seated us, seated you, if you're a true believer, if Jesus is not only your Lord, but your Savior, and he seated you with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Now, this is why you got to slow down when you read, because you'll miss this whole thing. I want you to look at verb tense, verb tense. Okay, let's go back. For he raised, raised. Is that present tense or past tense? That's past tense. Okay. For he raised in the past us from the dead. That's you and I, even though we weren't even born. Think about this. This is just God. Good God Almighty. Even though we weren't even born yet, we were already created in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. And God made provision through Christ to provide us a way, even though we hadn't even hit the planet yet, we were already in God and God made a way for us to come back to him. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. So when Christ was risen from the dead, we know that he died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb for three days, and then he was raised from the dead. Did you know that when he got up off that table, we got up with him? Mm, good God Almighty. And then what happened? And we know where Christ is right now. Where is he? And seated us with him in heavenly realms. Did you know that you're seated with Christ? Seated. What tense is that? Present tense or past tense? That's past tense. Which means that when Christ was exalted to the right hand of the Father, which is the hand of power, by the way, Right now in heaven, God, the Father is on the throne. Our heavenly Father is on the throne. And Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah is seated on the right hand of the Father. Where are you? You are not sitting here on the earth listening to me talk. Spiritually speaking, you are seated with Christ. It says, and seated us with him, past tense, in heavenly realms. Why? Because we are united with Christ Jesus. Uh, we began this teaching today asking the question, are you a follower of Christ? Are you really a follower of Christ? Because if you are a follower, a follower of Christ, you are united with Christ. And if you are united with Christ, verse six is real in your life because you're seated right now in heavenly places. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. It's a foreign concept. It's hard to understand, but you got to understand this. When you came to Christ, and when you were baptized, you not only were baptized in water, but you were baptized into Christ. And the Bible says you were raised in newness of life. So we're talking about a spiritual reality. This is real. 
And this is why when you walk here on this planet, you're not just walking as a human being here on this planet. You are literally an ambassador of Christ, a part of the body of Christ, a part of the bride of Christ, a part of the building that God is creating to establish his kingdom in the earth. What kingdom? The kingdom of heaven. It was what Christ came. This is what Jesus came to teach. He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what he taught. And we bring the kingdom with us everywhere we go. So when we walk, we walk not in our power. We walk in his power. When we talk, we talk in his power, not in our power, right? This is by the power of the spirit of God. Verse seven. So God, why did God do all this? And this is what I love about verse seven. You got to look at this. God is awesome. Verse seven says, so God can point to us in all future ages as examples of his incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. God put us into this earth before, let's say Adam and Eve uh, sinned. God knew he was going to send his son to, to redeem all of those who were born after that. And God says, now think about this. You will be born the day you were born. Why? Because God was going to raise you up to be his, to come back to him. Why? So that you for all eternity, he could point to you and say, look at my child. Look, my child chose to come back to me. And for all eternity, you become an example. Look at verse seven. So God can point to you in all future ages. That's time without end. That's eternity. And as an example of his incredible, the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. You know, a lot of people think that God is, God is just mean and, you know, he's evil. And why does he let bad things happen to good people? And they get confused. And God's like, look, God is a good, good father, but he's also a just and holy God, righteous in all his ways. And so he has a way he wants things to be done. And it's all written in the Bible. So if you read the Bible, you can understand who he is. And he wants you to know who he is. You know why? You know how I know, because he gave us his word. And people, a lot of people have told me, and I, you know, I've been a pastor for a while. And they'll say, you know, Pastor Stephen, I just don't hear God's voice. And you ask them one question. Someone who says that, you ask them one question. Are you reading the Bible? And a lot of them will say no. And the reason why you want to point them back to that is because the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, is God speaking. Right. And so that's why we study so we can hear our father and know what he's saying. So verse seven. So God can point to you in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are what united with Christ Jesus. Not everyone who calls themselves a believer is truly a follower of Christ. Not everyone who says they're a Christian are a true follower of Christ. We know that's a fact. We've been studying that. You can you can look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, and Jesus will tell you exactly who's going to make it into heaven and who's not. It's very simple. So that's a homework assignment. Make sure you do that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, write that down and take a look at that. But let's go, and I, I want to, and I told you guys, I want to make sure that we get the chapter because we do want to cover it in context and get an understanding, right? And so we are in Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm just going to read through this, chapter 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, we already understand, you now understand what that means, verse 2. You used to live in sin, and we know the sins we've committed in our past. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. That's what that's the reality we live in. There's two worlds. There's the seen world that you see with your flesh, and then there's the spiritual world that cannot be seen with the physical eyes. It has to be seen by the spirit. And it's and it's right here. It tells you in verse two, he's the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And there's tons of people on the planet that from our past to our present that we can point to that have no problem telling you that they worship the devil. They have no problem letting you know that they have a plan that has nothing to do with God and they do whatever they want to in their flesh. That's what verse two said, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. We used to be like some of those as well. Some of them people as well. All right. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So when you see things happen in this world that's bad and evil, don't get confused. We are children of light. Light brings revelation and understanding. We know they do that because the devil is who they're obeying. It says in verse two, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. They are obeying the devil, right? Check this out. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. They refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. See, everybody, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we're not pointing fingers in terms of condemnation for them because we used to be just like them. 
but we also can speak the truth in love. And we know being like them, the only thing we deserve was death because we were born in sin, rebellious against God and didn't want to do his will. We did what our sin nature wanted us to do. and We did what the devil wanted us to do. And so the wages of sin is death. We know that. Verse three, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Now, let's understand this. God is holy and righteous, but he didn't want a bunch of robots. He gave us a free will. Now, imagine if you were God and you created all of this creation, earth and everything in it, you created mankind and you put them on your planet with all the resources they need to live and survive. And they every day woke up angry at you and pointed fingers at you and fists at you and yelled at you and said, you're not a good God. I'd rather serve the devil. How would you feel? You feel like you need to destroy them. Why? Because they are rebelling against the one that loves them enough to even give them life. Right. And so God is like, OK, I'm going to give them time to work that out, but I'm also going to give them away. And that's Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse four. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Say, I am united with Christ. All right, say that again. I am united with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Verse seven. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown and all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Glory to God. All right, verse eight. God saved you. This is why God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. God gave you that gift. Verse nine, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are all, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. All right, so we're going to pause right here, verse 9 and 10. All right, so let's look at salvation. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So there's nothing that you have done on the earth that, that is the reason why you're saved. It is what God has done for you. And that's why he says, so none of us can boast about it. And that's important because we have to stay humble and meek. Those who have come out of darkness into light, our job is to let those who are still in darkness know that they can also come out of darkness into light. We are no better than anyone else. Now, now I always teach this. There's only two people on the planet. There are sinners and there are forgiven sinners, but we're all sinners. Make no mistake about it. Okay. As a pastor, I sin, you sin, everybody sins, nobody's perfect. And your righteousness, the, 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 the most holy point that you reached in your life and the place where you were uh, flowing with God, your righteousness, the Bible says, is that's filthy rags. It can't even compare to who, who God is because he is holiness. All right. So we don't have any place to boast about that, but we can boast in the Lord. Right. And the power of our heavenly father. And that's what we do. Look at verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Good God almighty. I need you to feel that today. Say that I am God's masterpiece. When you look at yourself in the mirror, do not let the world tell you who you are. Don't let the devil tell you who you are. Don't let nobody tell you who you are. Don't even let your mind wander into who you are, because oftentimes the thoughts we think are not righteous or holy. You see yourself and you say, I am something and you'll see something wrong with yourself. I am fat. I am sick. I am. You'll say all the wrong things. You are God's masterpiece. And you may not look like everybody else, but guess what? God designed you that way. So however you're designed, God said, look, you're made in my image and after my likeness, right? Image, you look like him, likeness. You should act like him. You should be like him, okay? For we are God's masterpiece. A masterpiece, if you can think about it, is not something that was thrown together. It was something that was planned for, planned out, diligently um, created. You were, you were built and created specifically to be exactly who you are as a masterpiece of God. And you think about the human creations on the planet that we call, call masterpieces, whether it be a painting or a statue or a building or artwork or, or ta tapestry. If you think about a masterpiece, that doesn't even compare to who you are because God made you. We made other stuff. And that stuff is nothing compared to what God's made, but you are God's masterpiece. And look what he says. He created us. He, he, he has created us or created you anew in Christ Jesus. Now, what does that mean? You have been created anew. That means that the old you 
is dead. The old you who didn't even know God, who was at imminent enmity with God and, and divided against him, when you came to know Christ and you submitted to Christ and, and you received Jesus as your as your savior because you repented of your sin and He you want him to save you from the judgment of hell and death, he became your savior. And then from that point, there's a second step. You have to receive him as Lord. Now, when someone's your Lord, you do what they say. And in fact, there's a scripture where Jesus is talking to a group of people and they were calling him Lord and he stopped them on their tracks. And this is why as true children of God, we got to be like this. It may sound harsh, but this is what Jesus did. They kept calling him Lord. Who he is, he is Lord. But he turned to them and he said, why do you keep calling me Lord when you don't do what I say? Good God Almighty. I, I want you to feel that in your shine and eye right there. Jesus, the son of God, Yeshua Amashiach, what if he said that to you? What if he said to you, you say you're my child, but you don't do what I say? How can you be my child when you're not following me, right? Today, we want you to make up in your mind. If you're listening to this, you're watching this recording, make your decision today to choose him. God says, I set before you today, life and death, blessings and curses, choose life. You have to choose to believe in the son of God, that God sent him uh, to, to, to die for you on the cross so that you can be forgiven of your sins and that he raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved. You have to choose that. Why? Because if you choose that, look at, look at that second part. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us or created you a new in Christ Jesus. The Bible says old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, right? What does that mean? Your, your old life from this point in time, all the way back to you were born. I don't care what happened to you. I don't care what you did or what sin you created, you, you did or, or you participated in. This is what the reality is. God says that he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He's going to wipe all that stuff away. Now, I've told y'all my testimony. I've been abused as a child, sexually, mentally, physically. Y'all know my story. Y'all know all the stuff I did wrong, the stuff I did, and I've shared with y'all my testimony. Since I committed, the sins that happened against me, the sins that I committed, when I came to Christ, I felt worthless. I was at the bottom of the barrel. I was under the barrel. I felt like either I was going to kill somebody or take my own life. And in fact, I have attempted to, to take a couple people's lives in my lifetime. God is so faithful. I felt worthless. And when I knew and I heard that God has made provision for me to be restored and be forgiven through Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you, beloved, if you listen to my voice and you never heard this, God wants you to come back to him no matter what you've done. That's love. And the type of love that is, is a, uh, it's called agape in the Greek, which means unconditional love. God loves you so much. He's seen everything you've done. He's, in fact, he already knew you were going to do those things. Think about this, because he's omniscient, all right? He knew it. And even though he knew that was going to happen, he knew that there was a way for you to be restored through him. Why? Because he's God. He's also another omni, omnipotent, all-powerful. He's all-powerful, and he's made a way for you to come back to him, but you got to repent in your heart. And so in my heart, I remember the moment. I remember that season. I was like, can I truly be forgiven? I am worthless. I deserve to be in jail or dead. Can he really forgive me? And I got a hold of God's word. And he says, look, there's a scripture that says, I will live and not die and, and glorify all the works of the Lord. Man, the Holy Spirit dropped that thing into my heart. It became an anchor in my salvation. I will live and not die and glorify all the works of the Lord. And I said, I can be forgiven and I can be cleansed. And so I got, I came to God and said, God, look, I'm willing. And in fact, this is what I said. I said, I give you 30 days. I did. I did. I, I told the Lord, I told God almighty. I said, if you can prove to me in 30 days that you are God, I'll serve you the rest of my life. And do you know, he did exactly that. Now I wasn't perfect in my walk, but I was being perfected. And day by day, that old stuff was dropping off of me and I was becoming newer and newer every day. And all the past that came that happened in my life, when the devil would bring up those thoughts of past sins, I would rebuke him in Jesus name. And in fact, I would I would pray for the people that he was reminding me that I had sex with, right? I would pray for them and the devil started to leave me alone because I was praying for them that they would get saved and then they would save other people, right? So that's what we got to do. We got to know that old things have passed away. All things have become new in our own lives. And we don't have to be, if you were bad yesterday, you don't have to be bad today. You can recognize that I said some stuff wrong. I thought some stuff wrong. I did some stuff wrong. I got the wrong motive in my heart. Lord, fix me, change me, renew me, restore me 
right? We restore a, a right spirit in me to cause me to glorify you in everything that I think, say, and do. Why? Look what it says. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can what? Do the good things he has planned for us long ago. Good God Almighty. I know you felt that. I, I, I trust you understand what that means. That means before you were even born, God planned for you to do good things in the earth. In fact, God didn't even let you come to the earth until it was time for you to do good things. Now, sure, we do bad things too, but guess what? The, in God, when you come to the earth and you come to God, God will wipe all those bad things away and we will do good to glorify him. Why? Because he planned it. Look what it says. He planned for us long ago to do the things that are good in his sight. And that should give you some freedom. Like, I can be good. Like, my, I don't care what my mom said or my dad said, like, you'll be, you'll never be nothing. You're worthless. You don't have no talents and no giftings. You look, look at you, you done lived all this time and you haven't done enough. You haven't become enough. All those things are lies. We are created after the image and in, in the likeness of God to do good works that he planned for us long ago. And you can see it in verse 10. And so you can get excited. Get excited because you are with Christ. You are together with Christ and God has a plan for your life. Now, I'm going to keep reading, and we're going to, we're going to get through this today. All right, so we're going to get into the next section, oneness and peace in Christ. Verse 11, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Okay, so there's, so in, in the scriptures, there's two types of people. There's Jews, God's chosen nation at the time, and the Gentiles is everyone who's not Jewish. So that's all the other humans on the planet. If you weren't born from the 12 tribes, then you weren't, you weren't considered to be Jewish at, you know, from a bloodline standpoint. And everyone outside of that Jewish family, the, the 12 sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, those descendants from them, if you weren't a part of that, that family, then you were considered to be what's called Gentiles or all other humans on the planet. Okay, that's what that means. Verse 11, don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision. Circumcision is a, um, it is a physical medical practice that that establishes a covenant with God by uh, by the the uh, medical procedure called circumcision, right? And and all the other nations didn't practice circumcision. Circumcision was given to Abraham by God to establish the covenant as a blood covenant because you have to cut off the foreskin of the male body part um, um, body part to establish God's covenant in the earth as a part of that agreement. And so it was only the Jewish nation that was practicing that at the time. All right. Um, and so if you weren't circumcised, they said, because you're not even circumcised, you are ungodly. You have no, no covenant with God is basically what the Jews said. Okay. All right. So it says, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts, look at that. I'm gonna read that again. Let's go. I'm gonna go back. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. That's key. Every word of God is key. God put it in, the, in in his word so we can understand something. Even though they were the chosen nations and he put this, the chosen nation and and, and chosen nation and they and he put the covenant in place through circumcision. He's he letting you know right here, even though they had it in their bodies as a point of covenant, they didn't have it in their hearts. Good God almighty. Do you know people could physically do the things that it looks like that they're doing what God wants them to do religiously, but in their hearts, their hearts are far from God. They have a form of godliness, but the end is destruction. Let's look at verse 12. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship. Look at the word citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God. And look at that and without hope. That's what's happening in the world right now. People are living without God and without hope. You should write that down because this is the things we bring to people when we testify and we give them our testimony and we share with them the good news, which is the gospel. It is hope in God. That's what we share with them. So they get that. All right. But now you have been, you, wait a minute, somebody has something? It sounds like, uh, does anybody have a question or a point they want to share? Okay. If not, let's keep going. All right. So uh, in those days, let's 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 keep going. Let's read on. verse verse 12. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. 
But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Hallelujah. Through the sacrifice of Jesus. Verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles. And look, this is the work of Jesus. Why did, why did, why did the son of God come down to earth to save, uh, to save the lost, right? But there's a process. Now watch this process play out. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He's the prince of peace. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people, right? So now all of mankind is one again through Christ in his own body on the cross. That's how he did it. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. So from that point when Christ came, there was only one people. It is the human race. There's only one race on this planet. It is the human race. Verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. And you see that. Again, you're going to see this kind of uh, the, this wordplay uh, throughout the scripture that we were created in Christ. What did Christ do in himself? He united the, the world, all those who are in, on the planet. He united the people again. Because remember, Jesus came as the second Adam. The word of God says he's the second Adam, a life-giving spirit to fix what happened in the garden from the first Adam. And with the first Adam and Eve, all of the people who were supposed to be born from Adam and Eve were supposed to be one people of one kind. They were supposed to be united in God, walking according to his will on the planet. And God was supposed to be walking with them in the cool of the day, all of the people being holy before him by choice because they have their own will. Jesus came to fix that. He came to restore us back to God's original plan. And so he had to unite the people. So it says that he, as the Prince of Peace, came and made peace between the Jews and the Gentiles in himself. Verse 14 says that. Verse 15, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups, which means that anyone who's in Christ, you know how you pray in Jesus' name? Anyone who's in Christ are united in him. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what nationality you are, what country you live in. It doesn't matter. There's only one race. There's only one people, the human race and the people of God, if you're in Christ. Verse 16, together as one body. Now, look at this. We are now the one body of Christ. Together as one body. Christ reconciled both groups to God, right? So he brought us back to God, back in right standing. He reconciled us back to God, both groups, to God by means of what? His death on the cross. That's the work he did. The death on the cross, remember, without the shedding of blood, there's no remissions of sin. So he came as the perfect sacrifice to die on the cross as a holy man, sinless, the son of God, so that by dying on the cross, he established a way for us to come together as the body, as one body, to be forgiven for our sins, all of us. And our hostility towards each other was put to death, which means that at no point in time, after Christ died on the cross, should Jews feel like they were better than Gentiles. Jesus just totally did away with that. It's all gone now. We're all now, those who follow Christ can be children of God by the power of God and by his spirit. There's no distinction made in the scripture after Christ that Jews are somehow special. Why? Because those who were Gentiles were grafted into Christ, where the Jews were supposed to be when Christ came, he came to his own people, and there were those who followed him, but mostly the religious people, they did not. They, were, they didn't see him as the Messiah. They were against him. And in fact, they planned with the Romans to kill him. Those Jews made a way to, for us to be grafted into their place. And so grafting is when you take a plant or a tree and you cut a little space on the stalk of the tree and you take a branch and you, you attach it to that tree so it can get the nutrients and you tie it on so it can grow and be sealed to that tree. We've been sealed to Christ because of that. They made a way for us through their disobedience. We, we became obedient and we received Christ, right? So that's the way that worked. Verse 17, he brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Right. Like I said, there were those who wanted they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for deliverance. They were looking to be restored back to God. Verse 18. Now all of us can come to the father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Now, again, I told you all when we read, we don't read the scripture. We study the scripture that should have stood out to you. What I just said, this is the first time you've heard the Holy Spirit in this chapter. Now, I'm going to read 17, 18 again so you can catch this. He brought this good news. That's the gospel of peace, the gospel of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the father through the same Holy spirit because of what Christ has done for us. 
Why is that important, Pastor Stephen? Let me tell you why I'm glad you asked that question. It's because the Holy Spirit is the power of God working salvation in the earth. Now, remember in the beginning in Genesis, and we study this, that it was the Holy Spirit hovering, hovering over the face of the deep in the darkness, waiting for God to speak, to do his will. He's doing the same thing over the hearts of men. Over all the dark hearts of men, the Holy Spirit is waiting for those who are hearing God's word, because we plant seeds, we water seeds, but God gives the increase. He's waiting for those who want to hear truth, want to know God, want to be forgiven, to want it. And when they want it, boom, then he moves. Because it says, now all of us can come to the Father. So now we can come back to God, right? We can come back to God because we do it through Christ, through the same Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit. This is the Spirit of God that operates in the earth to do his will. And he will give you the power for those who walk by the Spirit of God. To them gave he power to become the sons of God. So don't do things on your own anymore. You got to tap in. You got to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. And you got to know he's with you. He is in you, not only on you in terms of anointing, but he's also in you if you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Christ. If you have received Christ not only as Savior, but as Lord. Savior because he saved you from, from your sins on the cross and by resurrection from the dead, but also Lord because you do what he says. Okay? The Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. All right. So now this is who you are. Then we go to verse 19, a temple for the Lord. So now you Gentiles, all right, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Good God almighty. There is no family name you would rather be a part of than to be a part of the God of all creation, right? You don't, look, Jehovah Jireh, uh, Yahweh, our God, you're a part of, part of his family through Christ. Verse 20, together we are his house. Remember we talked about this. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, right? Because they came before us ever since Adam and Eve sinned, all those who came after him, Seth and through the line of Seth, all those who, who established the covenant in the earth through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets that are in the Old Testament and the New Testament, this is what it's talking about. They laid the foundation for you to stand on, for us to stand on, that God's building this spiritual house. We already studied that, all right? And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. So the first stone laid to build this was Christ. And it's the chief cornerstone on which all other things stand. Verse 21, we are carefully joined together in him, becoming, look what it says, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. So you may not feel like you're all the way there. You might not feel that you're holy every day, but you are becoming. And if you're going to be anything in this world, you need to know that you're becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Verse 22, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. I'm gonna say it again. Verse 22, through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. Praise God. Now look, this is what you need to know. God no longer lives in buildings made by man's hands but he lives in the hearts of man. We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. That building you go to where the believers are, the followers of Christ are, that's just the building. That's not the church. We are the church. The church is a living, breathing organism. We are the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, and the building that God is building to be a dwelling place. We are that tabernacle, that tent. He's in us. And in fact, and you may have never heard this before, we are the only part of all creation. Now listen to this. God revealed this to me years ago. It was so beautiful. We are the only part of all creation that has within it God uh, the Father, God the Word, which is Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. The whole Godhead dwells in us, in us. There's no other part. There's no animal. There's no plant. There's no rock. There's no place on earth or no being, heaven or earth, that, that has that. We not only are made in his image and after his likeness, but we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have to look inward to the power that God has given us. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We have to look inward to the power that God has given us through the Holy Spirit, through his word being etched on our hearts. The word of God is on our hearts and where God's word is, he is, right? We have to allow that word to come out of our mouth because God inhabits the praises of his people. If you want God's presence to be in your presence, start praising him. Your, your praise is a ladder that allow God to come down into your very environment. 
right? From your belly will flow rivers of living water, life-giving water, right? Remember the, the, the woman at the well when Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you would ask of me a water and you would never thirst again. You should be able to, to not only read God's word, retain it, but also speak it out of your mouth. And the Holy Spirit will bring it back to your mind when you need it. And you need to get that. And you need to know that God has not only given you provision for that, but there's something else he wants you to do. He wants you to know that you are not yet who you're going to become. So just because you are where you are today and you feel like this is who I am, no, you're becoming more. You're going to be more because God is going to do more in your life as you yield yourself to him. And as you read his word and you get instructions as we're getting today, right? And that's what this study here is on arises for us to understand who we are in God so we can walk according to his will. And this week, this study is, I am raised from the dead with Christ. That's what this study is, raised from the dead with Christ. So you're no longer dead in sin, but you're alive in Christ. Good God Almighty. I just, I love God's word and I, and I trust this is blessing your heart. I know the Rise family is with us live here in our studio and they're blessed. But we want you to take notes because this is important. And you want to also make sure that you understand everything in context, right? So that's why we take time to just not just read a scripture, because sometimes you'll hear ministries will, will come and they'll just share a scripture and then just talk from that scripture. Um, but but I want you to know that you got to read the whole uh, context of the story so you can understand what God is trying to say to you. OK, so now look at this. We're going to move to Romans. And I'm just going to share a little scripture so you can get this, because that was our chapter reading. But I want to bring you to Romans. Now, we're going to look at this. Romans chapter, and I'm on Bible Gateway, BibleGateway.com. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 through 11. And this is what it reads. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Remember, when you read the scripture, read it as if it's speaking to you, because it is truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And so he'll reveal how this applies to you, Right. So when I was utterly helpless, Christ came just at the right time and died for me, a sinner. That's how you see that. Verse seven. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. That means good people. If there was a good person, someone that was holy and, and they were about to die, would you give your life for them? Some people are like, ah, I don't know if I would die. I mean, I love them, but I don't know if I would die for them. Right. And that's what it's saying. Though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Verse eight, but God showed his great love for you, for us, by sending Christ to die for us while we were we were still sinners. That means we weren't even righteous or right or desiring to be a part of his kingdom yet. We were still sinners, enjoying sin, going to clubs and having sex and doing drugs and cussing and fighting and stealing. And, you know, we were just doing what our base nature, our sinful nature wanted us to do. Even in that state, God says, you know what? I'm sending Christ right now. I'm sending Christ. I'm sending my son right now to save you from your sin. Verse nine. And since we have been made right in God's sight, how? By the blood of Christ, right? There's nothing we did because we're saved by grace through faith, right? Not of works. So we're not even boasting about that. He says, it says, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So we're going to read it again. Verse nine. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation, right? So in Christ, there's no condemnation to those who love the Lord, right? And we're upright before him. Verse 10, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. And look at verse 10. Verse 10 tells you something about God that people, you won't even hear pastors tell you this. But look what it says that you are. This is, uh, this is why Jesus restoring us back to him, reconciling us back to him, has given us relationship with God. What kind of relationship? For since our friendship, but you didn't know that. For our friendship, how, do you treat God like he's your friend? Right? He's our father, but he's also our friend. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemy, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Jesus is alive and reigns forever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. And because he's alive, we are alive in him. And we can stand knowing that we are also friends of God and we've been restored by the death of his son on the cross. Now, verse 11, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God. Why? Because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. I am a friend of God. I feel like, I wish I could sing. I was singing it for you. But that song, I am a friend of God, is real. Why am I a friend of God? It's because I want to be, no, it's because he calls me friend. Come on now. He calls me friend. God is one, God wants us to bring, he wants, he, he doesn't want us to be far off. He wants us to know that we can come close. 
He wants to bring you close, beloved. He wants to bring you close to him today. Not only are you his child, he loves you, he saved you through Christ, but he's friendly towards you. He loves you. And he wants you to know that we cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father, right? So he's not just God to us, right? Other people can just call him God, but he's Father. He's Abba, Father to us, and he's also our friend. So from this point forward, Romans chapter 5, verse uh, 11 establishes, so now we can rejoice. See, have joy. And it says, read, do it again. Stay in that state. Rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Now, don't let your present state, the state of your life, the things that you're dealing with, whether it be bills or family or sickness or the future, don't let the, the, the present state you're in uh, negate the fact that you have the ability to rejoice in this wonderful new relationship with God. In fact, I will tell you, for those who know who God is, God said in his word that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there's a correlation between proximity to God and the release of blessings in your life. And you got to understand that the closer you get to God, the less the devil can do to you. The closer you get to God, the more favor you will have, because if you're willing and obedient, you should eat the good of the lamb. This is the scriptures. So you have to press into your relationship with God today and just be better today than you were yesterday. And if you do that every day, oh my gosh, if you do that every day, you're better tomorrow than you are today. You are going to be walking so close to God in holiness and righteousness because you're going to be reading his word and you're going to be living out what his word says. All right. So we got two more scriptures and then we're going to stop here because I definitely want to open up for you guys to share uh, any revelation or any questions that you might have. But we're going to jump over to Titus. Because the word of God says, let every word be established by two or three witnesses. So I always want to give you guys this so you can understand this. Titus chapter three, verses three through seven. And I do want you to get ready, those who are alive here in our Arise studio, our family that's with us, uh, to share any revelation, anything that stood out uh, or any questions you might have. Because the fellowship part is even better than the Bible study part to me. So I'd love to hear from you guys as God's giving you guys revelations as we study. All right. Titus chapter three, verses three through seven. Once we too, this is verse three, once we too were foolish and disobedient, I know I was, and you you know you were, we were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures, true. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. Verse four, but when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteousness, righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he washed away our sins. Thank you, Lord giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. Verse six, he generously poured out the spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Oh, hallelujah. Look, Father, we just give you glory. We thank you that you are a good, good father and you love us and you have made provision for us we thank you for your word that you can just let us know how things actually played out and your will in the earth and, and how this works in our life. Father, we thank you. Titus gives us that insight. Verse seven, because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. If God, now I just want y'all to understand this. If God is doing all of this, this side of heaven, imagine what he has for us on the other side. He saved us for a purpose. And this life is training for the next. I want you to understand that from birth to death, this life is boot camp training on how to walk according to God's will in the earth so we can walk and rule and reign with him in eternity. I hope you caught that. I hope you caught that because to the level and degree that you walk with God in this life, to the level and degree that you are obedient to do his will, and to the level and degree that you bring his will to pass in the earth by thinking, saying, and doing what he wants and not what you want. Remember, Jesus prayed that. Jesus prayed it in the garden, not, not my will be done, your will be done. That should be in our hearts every day because you, you might want to take the steering wheel every day and drive yourself. You got to say, no, I'm a passenger in this life. Jesus, take the wheel. Okay. And if you know that this life is training for the next, then you will step up to who you're called to be as a child of God, an ambassador of Christ, a child of light to walk according to God's will in the earth and to do better each day. That's all God's requiring, just to desire to do better and as you read God's word, you know what to do because you start to understand it's always it's all written. And if we just do what it says, then we can walk according to his will. 
And again, Matthew chapter seven, I told y'all, you got to go there. Matthew chapter seven, verse 21. I'm not going to pull it up. That's your homework. Y'all know that's my favorite scripture because Jesus himself tells you who's going to make it into heaven. All right. So we're going to close out here on Colossians. Colossians will be the, the uh, final scripture here. Colossians chapter three, Colossians chapter three. And we're not going to read all of this, but I want you to understand something. This is, there's two sections here, right? Living the new life and then also instructions for Christian households, right? So in, in Colossians chapter three, if you're taking notes, verses one through 17 is about living the new life. And verses 18 through 25 is the instructions for Christian households, right? But I want to go to, we're going to look at living the new life. Verse one, since you have been raised, and this is past tense, to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. See, this is what we're supposed to be doing, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. See, glory to God. We talked about that. Verse two, think about the things of heaven, not the things on the earth. He's saying this is what you're supposed to do every day. Okay, so we got the world is, is, is great at giving us distractions with TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn and, you know, television programs and Netflix and, you know, Apple TV. There's a lot of distractions that cause us to think on things. But what are we doing according to God's will? Verse two, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Okay, Pastor Stephen, well, how do I think about the things of heaven? He's talking about thinking about the word of God. That's what he's saying. The word of God is the heavenly things. Verse three. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Ooh, that's a package right there. I hope you see it. For you died to this life. That means that whole worldly life that you had before you came to Christ. All those selfish, evil things you did, sinful things you did is gone. And your real life, look at this, is hidden with Christ. So you are with Christ. See it. I want you to see this. Your life is hidden with Christ. And where is it? In God. Mm, they put a bow on that thing. Verse four, and when Christ, who is your life, hey, God Almighty, I'm going to say it again. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. Verse five, so put to death, and this is our part. This is your power. This is what we do as children of light, as part of the kingdom of God. This is what we do. You, so put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. So if you if you want to start saying, okay, what, what are these impure things that are in me? What are these things that the world are trying to feed that's a part of this old sinful nature? Here's a list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Right. And I'm going to tell you, this is what the world, this is what the world uses to water those seeds in you. The things that you see, the things that you hear and the things that you do see here and do. OK, let me give you let me let me break it down a little bit more. Are you watching programs or videos of people who are sinners who love Satan? Are you listening to their statements, their acting or their music that glorifies the devil and not the kingdom of heaven? And you know who these people are because they feel with that have nothing to do with sexual, they, they're filled with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. They say it out of their mouth. You know, every spoken word is a doctrine. Every spoken word preaches a certain thing in the earth. It speaks a certain thing in the earth. It's either light or darkness. I dare somebody to, 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 to debate that. Everything that's spoken is either light or darkness. It, it either glorifies God or it glorifies the devil. You have to, it says, verse five, it says, so put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. You have to do this. This is your part as an act of your will. Verse six, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Y'all can play if you want to, but I'm going to tell you something. Somebody actually mentioned this the other day. When, when the sun is at its peak, it is at its brightest. I don't know if you've ever been driving or just walking and you looked up into the sky and you tried to look in the sun and you can't because the sun is so bright. And I don't know if you've ever been outside in the summer at the peak of its hotness, whether it was 99 or 103 degrees, and it was so hot, you had to go, you had to get in the house because it was so hot, it was burning your skin. If the, if the sun, the S-U-N, can be so bright and can be so hot that your body can't even exist in its presence, imagine the S-O-N, the Son of God, and God himself, Yahweh, coming with anger and you standing in his presence. That's why the Bible says that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. 
Why? Because God is coming in his anger. And we don't want that. We don't want, I don't know about you, because sometimes we're afraid of our boss. We, sometimes we're afraid of our spouse because we've done something wrong. Sometimes we're afraid of uh, 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 our managers or, or, or our pastor because we've done something wrong. If you're afraid of men and women on the planet, what kind of understanding do you have about the fearful reverence of God? Verse seven, you used to do these things when you when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger. See, he's, he's trying to tell you. This is the time while you're alive, because tomorrow's not promised to you. Dear, I look, look, dear sweetheart, let me tell you, beloved, let me tell you, I've almost died a bunch of times, a bunch of times, and you don't know the day of your death. And tomorrow is not a promise. You're not guaranteed and promised that you're going to have live tomorrow. And it tells you, verse, verse eight, but now is the time. Now that you're hearing my voice and hearing God's word, now is the time to get rid of anger, get rid of rage. Ma malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Verse 10. Now, this is what you do. After you've done that, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That's why we're here. Verse 10. Oh, glory to God. You need to highlight that. This is, what, this is why I'm here. I'm here to put on my new nature and be renewed as I learn to know my creator so that I can become like him. Woo, be ye followers of Christ. This, this, this is what we gotta be like. And 11, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile. Remember, we're one person in, in Christ now, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric or uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. Remember, we talked about that. We talked about that, he's in you. The hope of glory, verse 12, and I'm just going to read down to 17 and we'll stop here. Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Who am I to be? Who am I to be in this world? Let me see. Let's look at verse 12. This is who I'm to be. Since God chose me to be holy, a holy people that he loves, I must clothe myself. This is my choice. Just like you wake up every day and you put on clothes. You have to put and be clothed with Christ. You must clothe yourself with tender hearted mercy. And you need to write down these words. You need to look for the definitions. And you need to understand what that means in terms of your character and your personality. And you need to bring this into your heart. This is who I am. I have tender hearted mercy. I operate in kindness. I operate in humility. I operate in gentleness. And I operate in patience. See, he's telling us who to be. Verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults. See, we're not bringing condemnation. We are not bringing shame to people. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Forgive, look what it says, anyone, the people you like and the people you don't like. Forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now look, don't, don't trip. Verse 13 is a warning. You need to get this. It is a warning. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. He's telling you, that's not even a choice. That's like a command right there. Why? Because if you don't forgive others, he's not going to forgive you. I don't care if they're your friend or your frenemy or your enemy. He's telling you, verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults. Why? Because we all sin and nobody's perfect and people don't get things wrong. They're going to do and say things wrong. Okay, so get past that. Let's be mature. Your job is to forgive anyone on the planet who offends you. Don't be so, so, so psychologically weak in your mind that you get offended by everything and every person. Why? He's telling you, don't do that. Why? Remember the Lord forgave you. Now, if the Lord has forgiven you for all you've done, you think about all the sin that you've ever done in your life, and he's forgiven you, cleansed you, and set you free from the punishment of sin and death, and you dare to go out into this world and start judging and condemning other people? Think about that. Is that right? No. That's not right. Verse 14, above all, because love is about love, above all, clothe yourselves with love. What does that mean? The Bible says that God is love. So he's saying, look, stay in God and let that be the thing that you're clothed in and you walk in and people see your clothes. It's love. The things you say and do is the things they see. Above all, clothe yourself with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony. The only way you have perfect harmony in verse uh, verse 13, I mean, verse 14, is to do verses 12 through 13. If you do 12 and 13, you will do verse 14. 
you will have perfect harmony with the body of Christ. 15, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. No matter what storm is around you, no matter what trial and tribulation you're facing, no matter what temptation or, or aggravation of the enemy is trying to attack you, I'm telling you, if you have the peace of God, you have the power of God. If you have the peace of God, you have the power of God. Verse, verse 15, and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, be preeminent on the throne of your heart is peace. Why? Because that's Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. For as members of one body, you are called to live where? In peace and always be thankful in every situation. And the world will look at you and go, how can you be thankful right now? You lost your job or your car just broke down or this is happening with your family or this is going to happen to you. And you're thankful. Why? Because God is God. He's my source. And no matter what, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Right. So you got to walk in the power of understanding what peace gives you. Peace doesn't change the situation. It changes your heart. Good God. Come on now. Peace doesn't change the situation. It changes your heart. The way you perceive the situation is important. Verse 16, let the message about Christ and all its richness fill your lives, teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives you. Remember I told y'all to take notes? That's why it's important for us to study so that we can take notes because look what it says. This is what we need to do. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Right. So when God gives you revelation, it's not for you. It's for others. It's not just for you, I should say. It's for others. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Remember I said that? No matter what's happening, put some gospel music on and start praising. Put some praise and worship music on, music on and start praising the Lord. Why? Because God inhabits the praises of his people. And when God's presence drops in, his peace drops in and you get renewed and you can stand in the evil day, no matter what's happening in your life. Verse 17, and whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Good God Almighty, I just love arising. This is our mission. Verse 17, and whatever you do or say, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative. See, you don't represent yourself. You're not just living on the planet for you and everything you want, vacations and money in your bank account and, you know, fame and for God, none of that's important. What's important is if, that we do verse 17, whatever we do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're doing it for Jesus who died for you. He died for you so that you can live for him. And then when we do those things, we give thanks through him to God, the father. And I tell you what, the men will see your good works and glorify God in heaven. So you continue to do good. You continue to do it as unto the Lord. And what you do and say glorifies God. And you got to check yourself. I'm telling you, because I got to check myself. Don't just say it because you feel like it. Somebody's push, pushing your buttons and you're just going to pop off at them. Don't do that. You got to let love rule in the body of your heart. You got to have peace in there. So that when you speak, you're speaking as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do it, you glorify God. And that person looks at you and go, man, I thought she was going to be mad. I thought she was going to be unforgiven. And she's forgiving me. And even though I know I'm wrong, she still loves me or he still loves me. The people will see the goodness that you demonstrate in your life and glorify God in heaven. And that's why we're here. We're here to be a representative of God in the kingdom of heaven. Why? Why is that important? It's because that's what today's lesson is about. That we were raised from the dead with Christ to do what? To live for him. To live for him and glorify him in everything that we think, say, and do. All right. So I'm going to stop right there. Praise the Lord. Hopefully you got some good stuff out of, out of it. Uh, for those who are watching this by recording, like I said, we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. Uh, we got a lot of different channels, a lot of different ways for you guys to connect with us. We want to hear from you. And if you got anything, any questions about this, type it up in the message or make sure you get it to us through one of our social media apps and uh, let us know because we want to be able to help you get understanding. And we also want to hear the revelation that God's given you. And so we're going to go ahead and open it up to our Rise family, as, as we always do, to give you guys a chance to share with us either a question, a uh, revelation, or what you learned today, what stood out to you from today's lesson. So, all right. So who wants to go first? Feel free to unmute yourself and share. All right, Nita. Nita has something. Okay. Go ahead and unmute yourself and feel free to share. I like how you brought the different scriptures in and compared them. And what I got out of the lesson is both of the people that I asked for prayer about that has cancer, they are believers. They do walk with God. They play their music, the music of praise and worship. And the one, like I said, is ready to go back to God. And the one is fighting. And she wants to be a witness 
to tell everyone that she comes in contact as she healed. This is what I used to do. It got me here. But I just praise and glorify God that that will also help heal the family. And it was a beautiful lesson. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. You know, the word of God says that he that seeks to save his life will lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake will gain it. So whether we live or die, and I heard a pastor say this just recently, it blessed my heart. He said, you want to make the devil mad? Whether you live or die, glorify God. <laughs> he said, in the midst of his greatest attack, think about this, the devil's giving you every punch he can give you. Whether you live or die, you still going to glorify God. So you win no matter what. The devil can't do nothing with that. He, Man, I know that frustrates him to no end because he can't steal your hope because your hope is in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. All right, who'd like to go next? All good right, morning, now. this is Evelyn. Yes, I was just going to say, I got so many, so many good nuggets, but that verse four from Ephesians two, uh, for God is so rich in mercy. And we just thank God for grace, mercy, and favor. And then the other one, I am God's masterpiece. So he made us wonderfully. Um, and we should treat our bodies as if we are God's earthen vessels. Um, and then when you said to teach and counsel others with the wisdom God has given you, and I, I think about the um, mentoring program I've started with these young people and the notes that they've written saying how it's made such a difference in their personal and professional lives. So I'm sharing what God has gifted me with the younger generation. Praise God. Look, that's Evelyn Booker. I want to encourage you guys who are listening uh, to this recording. Go out and get her book. She has a book called A Winner in Spite Of. Uh, she's, and you guys know, she's one of my top five people on the planet. Uh, I love Evelyn Booker, and she's been used by God to bless not only my life, but so many others. But her book, A Winner in Spite Of, Evelyn Booker, you need to go look for that. Um, and it's about the journey that God had her on from birth to now uh, and how God used her and her family to to break uh, desegregation in schools, integration in schools and all of that uh, in the South. You got to hear her story. She also encourages everyone to be a winner in spite of, according to God's will. So you can do it too. So uh, praise God. We, we thank God for everyone. She's one of our founding members. Amen. To God be the glory. All right. Who'd like to go next? Good morning, Pastor Siv. It's Loretta. Good morning, Loretta. Um, I just want to say that so many things stood out about Titus 3, the the scripture you shared from Titus 3. It really sort of gives us um, like bullet points of why um, God gave us Christ and what it, his um, coming is supposed to do for us. And then what we are supposed to do for for God or for Christ that um, he gave he gave us Christ out of an act of mercy. He had compassion on us. And then by the spiritual transformation, regeneration, new birth, we will come to become children of God, his. And it's the act of the Holy Spirit so that and it's in verse seven. It says this is we all these things have happened so that we will become justified. And when we are justified, then we can experience the hope. And when we experience that hope by the end, as you shared, the things we do, the, the, the things we believe in, what we affirm, what, how we express even the words of our mother, things we say, how we conduct ourselves. It's all an expression of that hope that we've experienced. And it all started because Christ, God had mercy on us. He had compassion on us and he gave us Christ, not so that we would, we would have stickers on our cars but then we'll be mindful in every little thing the smallest of decisions how is that hope going to be um going to reflect Christ? How is that association we keep going to show and, and you use the analogy of of the um SUN in comparison to the SON. So if the SON is also supposed to be bright, shining brightly in us with our associations, our affirmations, our beliefs, cultural norms, things, societal values, the things we adopt and embrace, are they showcasing Christ? Is that hope we've experienced? Is it is it aligned with it? Or is it is it at variance? So I like how Titus 3, amongst all the other passages, sort of adds to what Paul has richly written in all the epistles. That's that's my take. 
<laughs> Thank you. Praise God. Look, right. I just love your spirit. You know, at some point you're going to have to teach. I'm going to talk to you about that. You're going to have to teach one of these weeks for me uh, because I just love the power of God in your life. And, and what you shared is powerful. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Who'd like to go next before we close? All right. All right. So good. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and I'm going to share. And so you guys write this down. These are the takeaways for today. we got three, three takeaways for today. Number one, God's mercy and love. All right. So despite our sinful state, God loves us. He has reached out to us and he's offering mercy instead of judgment. He's offering mercy instead of judgment. And this is the important part. Understanding his mercy helps us appreciate the depth of his love and the extent of our salvation. Man, God's love is so deep and he's done so much to give us salvation. We need to be thankful. All right. Number two is new life in Christ. Through Christ's resurrection, we've been made alive spiritually. This new life calls us to live differently, focused on the things of God, not on the things of this world. I'm say it again. This new life calls us to live differently, focused on the things of God, not on the things of this world. I want to caution you that you've been given time as a gift. Don't waste your time doing worldly things. Redeem the time and focus on doing things for Christ because only what you do for Christ will last. Remember, we talked about that in the judgment day. When you stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ for those who are believers, every your life from birth to death is going to be placed in the flames, the flames of God's judgment. And whatever, whatever is left when the, when the burning occurs, whatever is not of God is going to burn up. And whatever is done for God will, will, be, will, be, uh, will be there. You'll be rewarded because of what is sustained through the flames, those things that are made, the things that you did for him in this lifetime. So get busy doing the will, and, will of God. Whether you join a ministry, a church, a nonprofit, and you give your time, talent, and treasure, those are godly things to do, to get out there and live for the Lord and, and be used by the Lord. All right, number three, we are seated with Christ. Now, our position in Christ is not just about a future hope, but a present reality. I hope you got that today. We are seated with him in the heavenly realms, which gives us authority and power to live out our purpose here on earth, even right now. Now, for those who are members of the Arise family, the Arise family, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time, that we are in Christ walking according to his purpose and, and by his power. And I'll read that again. We are seated with him in the heavenly realms, which gives you authority and power. And you got to speak it. You got to know you have it and you got to decree it in the earth. Power to live out our purpose, the one that God has preordained uh, here on earth. That's what it's all about. All right. So we got uh, someone who wants to share. Is that Tiandra? You can feel free to unmute and share. Hi, I'm I'm sorry. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. I wasn't going to say anything, but it's just kind of been on my heart. And I just wanted to share very briefly. Um, there was a woman who was speaking and she's dealing with um, people in her family who have cancer. And I can just hear like the weariness in her voice. Mm. And um, I just wanted to, I don't know you. <laughs> Um, but I love you in my heart is kind of like aching for you and what you're going through. And recently, I've just been really, really, really on this journey to uncover the character of God and the purpose of Jesus. And um, something that I haven't really heard taught often um, that's been resonating with me recently is that when Jesus came, he kind of turned the entire world upside down. Um, and so the kingdom of God is completely different from what the world is. And so for the world, death is very final. Um, but through Jesus Christ, death is um, a victory. And the first half, the majority, like half of the book of Psalms are lamentations. Um, and I think it's okay to cry out to God and express like hurt um, and, and that you're just weary. I think that's okay to do, um, but he's still a good God and he still loves you and your family very much. And he's waiting to be reunited um, with your family member. And I just wanted to share that with you. And I'm sorry, that's it. I'm going back on mute. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, sis. Thank you for sharing that. So encouraging. Uh, and it's so true. Uh, as we, we are living this life, the only way uh, that you get to heaven is there's two ways, actually. There's two ways. Uh, you die and you go to heaven because you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Or God just takes you straight on up. And he only did that twice. So I don't think he's going to do that again. I haven't seen nowhere in scripture where he's just going to take folks straight on up and be with him outside of the uh, the second coming of Christ when the, when the catching away and the rapture occurs. 
Um, so all of us will experience uh, death just as sure as all of us have experienced life. Um, and so, like you said, I love what you said. That's for the believer is a victory. Hallelujah. I, I receive that. Praise the Lord. All right. Does anybody have anything else they want to share before we end? Because I'm going to go right into the uh, homework assignments. All right, Sam. Hey, brother. You can unmute and feel free to share. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't Sam. It was Nita. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, hey, Nita, go ahead. Feel free to share. Oh, thank you for saying that. I'm not weary because they're dying. I'm weary. My heaviness is on family relations, especially for people that are not with Christ right now, that don't know God and family relations that it will be a shock to them when people die. So if I'm not weary, but if you feel the heaviness, that's my thing. But along with this Bible study and what God's been sharing with me is to show up for them in love. So the person who's been with this person all of their life that's um, about to transition, show up in love. Show up. Show up in love. Let them know you show you love them. One family member take her to appointment. I took her to an appointment yesterday. Show up in love. I'll sit over there with somebody else and I will start doing this more. Sit over at the house. Do you gotta go run errands? But show up in love is what I encourage everybody to do. Show up for people in love with whatever they're going through. That's good. Thank you, Nita. And you know what? As we show up with love, it doesn't matter how they respond to the love. Love loves anyway. It's agape. It's unconditional. Uh, and certainly all of us who have family members that are unsaved and friends that have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, we have that same burden on our hearts for the lost. Uh, and that's a godly, godly thing. So, so yeah, do what uh, Teandra said. You, we got to go to the scriptures and we got to not only let God know what's on our heart and how we feel, what we're thinking, but read the word of God back to him. Say his word back to him. And, uh, and that's a beautiful way to do that is by going through the Psalms. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that encouragement. All right. So, uh, so let me go ahead and give the homework. This is homework. Got three points. Reflection. This is re a reflection exercise. So spend time in prayer this week. Thank God for his mercy and grace in your life. Reflect on the areas where you still struggle with guilt or shame and ask God to remind you of your new identity in Christ. Number two, scripture memorization. So Ephesians chapter two, verses four through seven. I want you to meditate on that in the verses and think about how they apply to your daily walk in Christ. Let that encourage you. And then write your thoughts down in the journal, right? You, you should begin keeping a journal, especially if you're going to follow with us through this series of who I am. Uh, God's going to reveal a lot to you and the journal is a good way to look back. In fact, the Lord had me find my journal a week ago and to go back and read what I wrote a long time ago. Man, it was such a blessing. To, to see the thoughts and the revelation that God gave me in the past. It's water and seeds in my present. Praise the Lord. All right. And number three, practical application. Identify one area in your life where you can live more fully in your new identity in Christ. And that could be in relationships, at work, or your thought life. Just make a plan to take a specific action this week that reflects your new position in Christ. Praise God. All right. So we're going to stop right here. And, and, and I do want to just, once again, before we close, does anyone have anything they want to share before we close? Because I always want to make sure we cover everything. Any questions or anything? No, we're good. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. So we're thankful that you joined with us and you stayed with us this whole time as we've been going through our study today, uh, looking at the scripture and understanding exactly what it means to be raised from the dead with Christ in newness of life. Uh, and hopefully you've gotten something today that's going to help you uh, just continue your walk in the Lord to become more like Christ and to glorify God in everything that you think, say, and do. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and, and pray us out. Remember, we meet every Saturday at 8 a.m. Please invite others to come and join with us. Share the link, uh, the Zoom link, and I uh, encourage others to come join us, join our Facebook group, our Instagram account, and all the other places, YouTube channel, everywhere we are. Especially on YouTube, like and share, uh, subscribe so that you can get all the updates and all of that as well. All right, so let me go ahead and pray us out. Father, we just thank you. Father, we come to you and we just thank you for your mercy and your goodness, for your grace, Lord, and your favor. Oh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for, for your obedience to death on the cross. And Father, we thank you for sending Jesus, Yeshua, Amashiach, Jesus the Messiah, our Christ, 
our Messiah to our world, Lord, to this earth to die on the cross. But more than that, thank you for raising him from the dead, Lord, that we could be raised in newness of life. The old man have, has passed away and behold, all things are new in Christ. Lord, this is this life we are now living. It's just a taste of your glory divine. I mean, you continue to reveal to us the blessings that you have in store for us. Your word says that I reckon that the suffering of this present life is not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. Father, we thank you that you're revealing your glory. We thank you for our Arise family. We thank you that you continue to bless us, Lord, protect us and guide us, that you continue to give us wisdom and revelation that we can walk in it and share your word with the lost and dying world around us. Help us to be the light in our darkness, Lord. Help us to know that you know our innermost man, our unspoken prayers, and that you're meeting all those needs. Father, continue to encamp angels around about us to protect us in all our ways. Holy Spirit, we give you free reign, free reign to teach us, to guide us, to convict us, to help us to become all that we need to do in our Father's eyes according to his will. And Father, we ask that you would forgive us for all of our sins, anything that we thought wrong, said wrong, or done wrong. We thank you that your word says you are faithful to, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, clean, clean our mind, our body, our soul, Lord. Out. We thank you that our spirit is being renewed daily and that we're becoming all that we need to become according to your will. We thank you for all those who are coming to know the Lord, all those who are receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior, all those who are stepping out of darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you for those who are being healed, uh, sanctified, set free. Lord, you're setting the captives free even now. Father, we thank you that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise until we meet again. May you reign with all power and glory from heaven to earth, Lord. May your name be made great by your children, and may we reflect your love into this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You guys have a wonderful week, and we will see you next weekend. God bless.